Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming. That was the first time this week in Australia that somebody's introducing, someone introduced to me without acknowledging the elders past and present. And I, I, and I would um, publicly shame you for that, but the, <laughs> but the worst thing about writing a book about public shaming is I'm not allowed to publicly shame anyone anymore. It's really annoying. <laughs> anyway. I, I'm going to refer to notes because, uh, for the slideshow because I've got a terrible memory. I've got a worse memory, and it's getting worse and worse. Um, and in fact, my wife quite recently, as a special treat, booked me a surprise spa weekend, which is like the worst special treat for me because uh, she knows I don't like being touched. Um, <laughs> anyway, I was, uh, I was being massaged. And, and I was trying to make conversation, it was awkward. So, and so the conversation got onto my terrible memory. And I said to the master, I've got, I've got a terrible memory. I don't remember anything about my childhood. It's all gone. And she said, as she was massaging me, she said, well, most people who don't remember anything about their childhoods, when they recover their lost memories, it turns out that they were sexually abused. <laughs> so, so I said, well, I'd remember that. <laughs> Anyway, um, I, I loved the early days of Twitter, and, and I still love Twitter to a large extent. I mean, this, this week, what's been happening with the refugee crisis shows you know, just how incredible social media can be as a force for good. And in, in the early days of Twitter, it was, it was just this kind of wonderful place of curiosity and empathy. It was like a place of radical de-shaming, like people would admit hitherto shameful secrets about themselves and other people would say, oh my God, I'm exactly the same. Um, and in fact, there was, there was even a phrase back then, um, Facebook is where you lie to your friends, Twitter is where you tell the truth to strangers. <laughs> and, you know, it got, you know, having, having funny and eloquent conversations with strangers got me through hard times that were happening in my actual house. Uh, and then we realized that when a powerful person transgressed, when somebody misused their privilege, we could, we could get them. We could hit them with a weapon that we understood and they didn't, a social media shaming. So if a columnist for the Daily Mail wrote something racist or homophobic, we, we could get them. Um, and, it, and it was a good feeling. It was like the democratization of justice. It was like hierarchies were being leveled out. Um, but I think what happened then was that um, we fell in love with getting people who had misused their privilege so much that a day without a shaming felt like a day picking fingernails or treading water. It began to feel kind of weird and empty when there wasn't somebody who had misused their privilege that we could get. And into this odd atmosphere. Last night, actually, in Brisbane, um, somebody said, you know, why, you know, why did nobody notice what happened with Justin Sacco was so terrible? And, and I think maybe it's because, like, when you first marry somebody and you're so besotted, and you're so besotted, it's like you don't notice when they start acting fucking weird. Uh, <laughs> because into this atmosphere stumbled this unsuspecting woman called Justine Sacco. Um, and Justine was a PR woman from New York City with 170 Twitter followers, and she'd tweet little acerbic jokes to them, like uh, this one. This was on a plane from New York to London, and she chuckled to herself, and pressed send, and got no replies, <laughs> and felt that sad feeling we all feel when the internet doesn't congratulate us for being funny. <laughs> you start to think, well, what's the point? And you surround yourself with people who feel the same way you do. So when they don't congratulate you for being funny, it's like the whole thing crumbles. <laughs> anyway, then she got to Heathrow and she had a little bit of time to spare before her uh, final leg from Heathrow to Cape Town. So she thought up another funny little acerbic joke and tweeted it to her 170 followers. <laughs> so... She chuckled to herself and pressed send and got no replies, <laughs> got on the plane, turned off her phone, fell asleep, woke up 11 hours later in Cape Town, turned on her phone, and straight away there was a text from somebody she hadn't spoken to since high school that said, I am so sorry to see what's happening to you. <laughs> and then another text from her best friend, Hannah, 
who said, you need to phone me right away. You are the worldwide number one trending topic on Twitter. <laughs> so what had happened was that one of her 170 followers had tweeted the joke to a Gorka journalist called Sam Biddle, and he retweeted it to his 15,000 followers. Later on, I, I, I talked to Sam Biddle by email and I asked him how it had felt to have started the campaign against Justine, and he said it felt delicious. <laughs> and then he said, but I'm sure she's fine. But she wasn't fine, because while she slept, Twitter took control of her life and dismantled it. It came in waves. First, there were the philanthropists. Then came the... <laughs> See, I, I agree with the middle sentence, but as we will establish, I don't agree with the first sentence. Um, then came the beyond horrified. Was anybody uh, on Twitter that night? God, there's fucking two and a half thousand of you here, statistically. <laughs> there must have been. I'm sure some of you are on Twitter that night, and I'm sure Justine's tweet overwhelmed your timeline the way it did mine. And I, I reacted the way that everybody else on Twitter that night reacted, which was, wow, somebody's fucked. And I <laughs> kind of sat up in bed and I propped the pillow behind my head and I was like... <laughs> and then I thought, I, I'm not convinced that joke was intended to be racist. There is a, a, a comedic tradition of this, like Randy Newman or South Park. Maybe, maybe what she was actually doing in that joke was acknowledging her privilege and then mocking it by doing an exaggerated version of it. And in fact, when I met Justine a couple of weeks later, I'm still the only journalist she's ever spoken to, and she walked into the bar just crushed. She was still wearing the business wear of her former life, because later on that night she was going to have to go into her office to clean out her desk. Uh, and as she walked in, just so pale, and wearing the business wear of her former life, it just reminded me of, like, Night of the Living Dead, that this spectral figure walking in. Um, anyway, so I asked her to explain the joke, and she said... Living in America puts us in a bit of a bubble when it comes to what is going on in the third world. I was making fun of that bubble. Um, but if anybody else um, realised, as I did that night, that that was you know, the presumed tenor of her joke, nobody said it. In fact, there's a, a writer called Helen Lewis, um, who works for the New Statesman, reviewed my book, and said that she was on Twitter that night, and she wrote, I'm not sure that that joke was intended to be racist, and straight away she said she got a fury of tweets from people saying, well, you're just a privileged bitch too. And so to her shame, she wrote, she just shut up and watched as Justine's life got torn apart. It started to get darker. Then came the calls for her to be fired. Thousands of people around the world decided it was their duty to get her fired. Corporations got involved, hoping to sell their products on the back of Justine's destruction. You know, a lot of people were making good money out of Justine's annihilation that night. Usually Justine's name was Googled 40 times a month, but that night and for the few days afterwards, her name was Googled 1,220,000 times, which means that Google made somewhere between 120 and $468,000 out of Justine's destruction, whereas those of us doing the actual shaming, we got nothing. We were like... <laughs> unpaid shaming interns for Google and Twitter. <laughs> then came the trolls. Somebody else wrote, somebody HIV positive should rape this bitch and then we'll find out if her skin colour protects her from AIDS. And nobody went after that person. That person got a free pass. Everyone was so excited about destroying Justine that, you know, and our, our shaming brains are so primitive that nobody could also handle destroying somebody who was inappropriately destroying Justine. And then Justine's employers got involved. And that's when the anger turned to excitement.
What we had was like a delightful narrative arc. We knew something that Justine didn't. And in fact, Justine's inability to explain her joke became just a huge part of the hilarity. Somebody worked out exactly which flight she was on, so they linked to a flight tracker website. And then a hashtag started trending worldwide. Hashtag, has Justine landed yet? Hipsters. <laughs> Justine was really uniting a lot of disparate groups that night, from philanthropists through to social justice people, through to trolls, through to these fuckers. That bar that person's talking about is the bar that we go to. And guess what? Yes, there was. And if you want to know what it looks like to have just discovered that you've been torn apart for a misinterpreted liberal joke, not by crazy trolls, but by delightful people like us, it looks like this. You know, um, my book came out in February, uh, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster since then. What I, what I usually like when I bring out books is for everybody to tell me that I'm great, and then everything's fine. But that didn't happen this time around. Um, and, and I've just finished writing a couple of pages I, um, that I think I'm going to put in the paperback of the book about what happened to the book after it came out. And so can I, can I try this out on you? I've literally just finished it. Um, I'll just read a couple of pages of this. Last Christmas, my US publisher sent me a box of Christmas cookies with a card that read, get some rest, 2015 is going to be a bumpy year. I emailed him to ask what he meant. He replied that some people were going to hate the book. Oh, nobody's going to hate it, I thought. How could they? I'm right. In February, the New York Times magazine published my story about Justine. Condemnation began hesitantly at first, a little uncertain, like a consensus waiting to form. The article did nothing but bring her back into the spotlight when we'd all moved on, someone tweeted. <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> her dad is a billionaire, someone replied. I'm not too worried about her. Justine's dad sells carpets. Twitter is the most flawed information swapping service. It's, it's just <laughs> constantly getting stuff wrong. Uh, and yet the mainstream media are already insecure about its place in this new world, like the nerdy kids sucking up to the bully, just allows Twitter to set the agenda and dutifully, you know, gets in place. That tweet didn't ruin her life, someone added. Justin Saku has a new job. Give me a break already. After a year, I thought when I read that one. She got a new job after a year. Nice people like us had effectively sentenced Justine to a year's punishment for the crime of some poor phraseology in a tweet, as if some clunky wording had been a clue to her secret inner evil. The fact that she'd managed to doggedly pull things back together after a year was now being used as evidence that the shaming had been no big deal from the start. I remembered a time I was on a beach in Scotland and a flock of terns singled me out. They circled above me for a while and then began to dive bomb, pecking at my head. I ran back to the road, shrieking and waving my arms in the air. You're probably too close to their eggs, my wife Elaine shouted after me. You should be aware of their nests. I have no idea where their nests are, I yelled back. <laughs> My wife and I have a lot of fights. Quite recently, we went to a party, um, a dinner party, and as we turned up, the host said, would you like some crisps? And I said, no, thank you, I'm going to have cereal when I get home. And, <laughs> and um, out the corner of my eye, I saw my wife was like mouthing something urgently at me, and I was like, what? And she went, be more general.
This early tentative disapproval felt like the turn circling and then the dive bombing began. After reading that excerpt from his book, I think it's safe to say John Ronson is a fucking racist. <laughs> an opinion was beginning to form and feed off itself that I'd written an attack on social justice, a defence of white privilege. In coming out against online shaming, I was silencing marginalised voices because online shaming is the only recourse of the marginalised, whereas the world automatically allows people like Justine to succeed. But I just couldn't see how Justine's shaming made anything better, given that her joke was intended to mock racism. What happened to Justine struck me as just another terrible thing happening in the world. I wrote about Justine not because I identified with her, although I did, but because I identified with the people who tore her apart. I consider myself a social justice person. This was my people abusing our power. This wasn't social justice. It was a cathartic alternative to social justice. I decided to try and encourage those people to read the book, and so I tweeted, by the way, the Justine Sacco story in the New York Times isn't a standalone article, it's an extract from a book. Oh, someone wrote, now Ronson's saying it's an extract from a book. What did that mean? It was always an extract from a book. <laughs> did you think I ran home and quickly wrote a book? <laughs> but anything I said in that moment, I realised, would just be more evidence for the prosecution. So I went back to being silent. Why isn't John Ronson replying to any of us, someone tweeted. Because John Ronson only replies to men, someone replied. <laughs> I liked it when people went for me in ridiculous ways, because when I recounted those comments to other people, they made me look good. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I said that out loud or just thought it. I didn't regret writing Justine's story. I was basically being told, it's fine to write about those wronged people, but don't write about that wronged person, because it makes us look bad. A train crashed in Philadelphia. Passenger cars were ripped apart. Eight people died and 200 more were hospitalised. A survivor emerged from the wreckage and tweeted, thanks a lot for derailing my train. Can I please get my violin back from the second car of the train? I think in the early days of Twitter, you know, people would have been curious and empathetic. They would have said, oh my God, I'm so sorry that you've just been in a train crash. What was it like? You know, a, a journalist's favourite question, my favourite question is why? But that's not how Twitter responded. Twitter responded, some spoiled asshole is whining about her violin being on that Amtrak that derailed. People died on that train. And she's an idiot. I hope her violin is crushed. And I hope someone picks it up and smacks it against the train. And fuck that little bitch and her goddamn violin. I would slap the fucking taste out of her mouth if she was in reach. And then after she deleted her Twitter account, too bad she's a coward and deleted her account. How will her violin ever be returned? And I hope you get your violin back from under the bleeding people. Good luck. And your violin can be replaced. The dead are gone forever. And self-absorbed cunt. And I won't be cutting her any slack. What a sickening skank. I hope her life is exactly what a nasty bitch deserves. And eight passengers dead, but she lives. No justice in the world. <laughs> like Justine, she was being shamed because she was perceived to have misused her privilege. And of course, the misuse of privilege is a much better thing to get people for than the things we used to get people for, like having children out of wedlock. <laughs> but a great number of people who hadn't just been in a train crash were now accusing a woman who had just been in a train crash of a <laughs> being privileged. <laughs> The phrase misuse of privilege was becoming a free pass to tear apart pretty much anybody we chose to. It was becoming a devalued term and it was making us lose our capacity for empathy and for distinguishing between serious and unserious transgressions. I visited a TV studio in New York to film a video about the book. There was a doctor on before me filming her own video. What's your book about, she asked me. Online shaming, I said. Oh, did you read that piece in the New York Times, she said. <laughs> I wrote it, I said. <laughs> oh, you must be so happy, she said. Actually, I'm not, I said. Why not, she said. Because there's a backlash with people calling me a racist, I said. So what do you want, she said. 
There was a silence. Xanax, I said. <laughs> she got out her pad and wrote me a prescription for 60 Xanax. <laughs> I've got to say, when I got home and I told my son that story, he said, you should have asked Roxy Coton. <laughs> it's kind of alarming, right? <laughs> After that, I was no longer anxious, but I felt groggy. <laughs> I had to weigh up whether to feel groggy or anxious. <laughs> Later, I mentioned this to the comedian Joe Rogan. Welcome to America, he said. That's our dilemma, groggy or anxious. <laughs> if, I, if I ended this now, it, I'd, I'd, it would all be great. It would be like a funny up to end it on. But I've written a couple more paragraphs, which I'm afraid doesn't do that. <laughs> Can I just warn you? Um, a 47-year-old Israeli government clerk called Ariel Runis was accused of racism. A black woman had been trying to renew her passport at his office in Tel Aviv. She later reported on her Facebook page that a female official had refused to allow her to use a special fast lane for people with babies. White people were being allowed to use the lane, but not her. So she complained to the office manager, Ariel Runis, who rudely brushed her off. Her Facebook post was shared 7,000 times. In response, Ariel Runis wrote his own Facebook post. Up until two days ago, my life looked rosy, but each Facebook share is a sharpened arrow driven into my flesh. All my life's work has at once vanished with a thrust of a word, disappeared. For years, I have worked to make a name for myself, a name now synonymous with the vilest of terms, racism. This will be my fate from now on. He posted his message, then he put a gun to his head. His body was found a few hours later. And then the next morning, the woman who made the original complaint wrote on her Facebook page, this morning I awoke to some of the worst news I have ever heard. I am sorry with my entire soul for the loss of a life. For years I experienced discrimination in Israel. The only time I told my story, a man was hurt. No one is more sorry than I am. If I could, I would keep silent this time too. And then the journalist from an Israeli paper writing about the incident wrote, the aftermath was disappointing. Instead of taking a sober moment to contemplate the seriousness of internet shaming, the powerful weapon was turned like a boomerang on the woman who had posted the complaints in the first place. Thank you.